Sheep and goats, they are different. Uh, one of the ways they're different is uh, how they fight. Male goats, when they spar with another male goat, will go up on their hind legs and bring their horns down on top of them, while as male sheep will simply run head to head directly into one another. If a male sheep and a male goat get into an altercation, the male goat has a greater chance of harming the male sheep. The two animals are also different in their diet. Uh, goats eat twigs, branches, um, uh, leaves, and vines. They can live in a host of terrains because they can even go up on their back legs to get at the leaves on the trees. So they can survive in a lot of different climates and environments. Sheep, however, are grazers of fields of grass. So they need a meadow or a field in order to be fed. The goats are also smarter than sheep. Um, they're more curious, uh, able to escape their pen, they're quite independent. They operate without care or concern for any of the other goats. Sheep, on the other hand, are herd animals, dependent on one another for their safety, and known if one sheep is to leave the herd, they often cannot survive and they will die. Um, goats, their, their coats can be sheared uh, and used for different fabrics, but they don't have to be. Um, sheep, you have to shear their wool or it will grow so thick that they will die. They're dependent on the shepherd to shear them. Um, and lastly, the two species can spread disease between one group and the other. So if a sheep, the sheep contract a disease, they can pass it to the goats and vice versa. Therefore, farmers recommend that it is smart to keep sheep and goats separate. So our question is, which of these would you prefer to be? Independent, resilient, Dominant, curious, and versatile, thus a goat, or herd dependent, docile, high maintenance, and sensitive. <laughs> Most of us might choose we'd rather be a goat, which is a problem when we see this vision that Jesus tells us about the Son of Man coming to separate the nations as a shepherd separates sheep from goats, because in this story, the sheep are the ones who are welcomed into the eternal blessedness of God in eternity, and the goats <coughs> are cast into eternal darkness. Now, sheep behavior, we're told, includes feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, uh, visiting the sick, and taking care of those who are in prison. And so these dumb and docile sheep that they are, when they're told this is sheep behavior, they ask the Son of Man, now when was it that we did this? They don't even know who they were doing it for. Jesus replies, whatever you do to the least of these who are my brothers and sisters, you do it also to me. So at this point, we learn that the sheep have just been doing what it's natural for sheep to do. There was no desire by the sheep to impress or prove their value or earn the reward from the Son of Man. This herd, these dependent animals who are weak and lost if they get isolated from the other, it's natural for them to care for the lonely, the sick, the hurting, and the grieving. They know that the entire herd's health depends upon the health of every member of the herd, and so it is therefore natural for the sheep to care for one another. The goats, when they're confronted by the Son of Man, are equally surprised. They also have no idea what is being talked about here. You see, they've been out doing their own thing, exploring new territory, trying new cuisine, finding ways to escape their pins. They're individuals, so they've thought about their own survival and their own well-being. They don't have any concern or care for the other goats or anyone else that's out there. It isn't that they've judged the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the prisoner, the homeless, as though they're undeserving of their compassion and care. Goats simply don't have eyes to even see the suffering. They don't have minds to comprehend the pain and the sorrow of another. They can't consider that their own well-being 
is dependent on the well-being of others, and the well-being of others is dependent on them. That's just not a goat mindset. And so I believe this passage in Matthew 25 is one of the most inappropriately um, interpreted passages in the whole Bible. And I think it's because we don't pay attention to the natural behaviors of these farm animals. What Jesus gives his followers is a model for true righteousness. This true righteousness comes from an expression of compassion and care that flows from one's very orientation towards one's neighbors. The key to this entire story is the ignorance of both the sheep and the goats. The sheep are by no means trying to prove their goodness, and the goats are not disobeying orders from God that they know about and thus behaving inappropriately. They're both behaving naturally to what kind of animal they are. It just so happens that the sheep behave in a way that aligns with the eternal will of God and the behavior of goats doesn't. Many of us read this story and as we hear it, we think, well, I am kind of goat-like. I mean, we live in a society that praises us when we can act as an individual or that we can show that we are self-sufficient. So we read this story and we start to wonder, oh, I don't want to be cast into the eternal darkness that's been prepared for Satan and his followers from the beginning of time. I need to change my ways and become like a sheep. And so we become goats in sheep's clothing. We, uh, we start trying to prove to ourselves, to others, to God, that we are holding up our end of righteousness before the Holy One that Jesus puts out there. This is the checklist that we've got to fulfill. And so we put pressures on ourselves to perform all these acts. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, visit the prisoner, take care of the sick. And we, we give ourselves a check mark every time we accomplish that fact, and then we wallow in our guilt and misery when we realize how many times we've failed in keeping the checklist. Desperate goats we become. So if you read the story that way, which I think is how most people read the story, your only possible outcome is to feel miserable, is to feel like a failure. You will be afraid. You will expect to be thrown into the outer darkness. Because even if you can uphold all these expectations that the Son of Man lays out, if you're keeping them in order to prove to the Son of Man that you are deserving of God's love, then you're missing the point entirely. The sheep, the ones who are praised here, they're not trying to prove their righteousness before God. They're entirely surprised by the words of the Son of Man as they come to them. This was their natural behavior as a herd. This was not because they'd adopted some kind of self-improvement plan for righteousness and perfectly executed it. And so as long as we see this story as a list of imperatives to prove to Jesus that we deserve his affection and his devotion and his love, we miss the point of the story. Instead, we come to recognize that we are actually sheep, docile, dependent. That we are part of the herd. Then we begin to see this story in an entirely new way. True righteousness is the recognition that I am dependent upon God and upon others for my well-being and that others are dependent upon God and upon me for their well-being. We're all part of the herd. It isn't a matter of proving anything. It's an interdependence. 
that honors life, that honors the well-being of each sheep in the flock. And in that mindset, there's no checklist that you have to maintain. There's simply the response of each person to offer what they have for the well-being of another and to recognize that you're going to be dependent upon the kindness of another for your own well-being also. And all of those offerings, all of those kindnesses collectively create among us a more just and kind community and a more kind society. In an episode this summer of his podcast, Revisionist History, the episode was called, I Was a Stranger and You Welcomed Me. Malcolm Gladwell explores moral hierarchies. He says that uh, most sociologists say that the highest form of, of morality is sacrifice, giving of your own life, your own well-being for the good of another. The second tier is generosity, which isn't giving up your, your life, but it's giving away your possessions or your money for the benefit of another. The third tier, then, is kindness. And kindness is often denigrated as being insufficient or not really making that much of a difference. It's just a bunch of small, disorganized, disconnected acts. What good, really, can kindness do? But Gladwell uses this episode of the podcast to explore how these communal acts of kindness become layered upon one another to bring transformation. One of the stories he tells is of Heil Reichmann, a Jewish man who survived the Holocaust in Poland. Here is how Reichmann and Gladwell tell his story. What kind of clothes did you wear? I was wearing ordinary clothes. They smelled, stank terrible. I didn't have anything except I was wearing. It's the oral history of a man named Chiel Reichmann who escaped the Treblinka concentration camp in 1943. He was part of a group that set fire to the camp and he slipped out in the chaos, which put him and a small band of other escapees in the middle of Nazi-occupied Poland, fugitives huddling in a forest. I looked like a living skeleton. Now, listen to what happened next. And we decided on the night to go to a farm, to a peasant, and ask for food. Some decent people helped us. They were starving, and someone gave them food. Reichmann decided that their best hope of survival was to walk to Warsaw, which was more than 50 miles away. He meets a second farmer who feeds him and gives him directions to Warsaw. On the way, he runs into a third man. The man paused and asked me, are you a Jew? I said, yes. This Christian man who was walking in the opposite direction from where I came, turned back and said, I'm taking you to my home. His wife looked at me. She ordered me to take off my salt shell and gave me a clean one. You know what? She said to me, this is my husband, only extra shell. They gave it to me. They gave me a hearty meal and inquired about my plans. Reichmann stayed with the family for two weeks, gaining strength. He left them and met a smuggler. The smuggler gave him a ride. He got to Warsaw, went to see someone he knew from before the war who was in the Polish resistance. His old friend was petrified. He wasn't able to sleep or eat because of fear that he is hiding a Jew. Reichmann told his friend, I can't blame you. But as he was leaving, his friend gave him papers, identifying him as an employee of the railroad. Now Reichmann could pretend he wasn't Jewish. This document saved my life. I used it all the time. The story keeps going on and on. A woman and her husband let him sleep under their bed. Someone else had a fallen down shack where Reichmann stayed for a bit. Someone else knew of an empty apartment in Warsaw and let him stay there. He met a watchman, befriended him. The guard invited him home for dinner, gave him a job, a place to stay. It was winter, freezing cold, the final days of the war. Warsaw was in chaos. Reichmann was huddled with a group of people in an abandoned building. 
We almost did not survive. We were hungry, cold, despondent. But one night, a man discovered our hiding place. The man asked them, are you hungry? He took them to a warehouse and opened the door. And we carried off a couple of hundred pounds of food and clothes that lasted us until the day of liberation. By my count, Chiel Reichman survived the war because of 11 acts of kindness. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. All these people who responded to Reichman, were they doing it because they felt they needed to prove to Jesus that they were deserving of his love? Did they feel like it was their responsibility to get another check on their checkbox of righteousness? It doesn't sound like it. it. Sounds like a herd of humanity. People who had a vision of the world, of who their neighbor was, and that they were someone who could offer a kindness to him, and that they knew that their well-being was dependent upon his well-being and that the well-being of the world requires this shared kindness. So stop reading these verses in Matthew like they are your report card, and that Jesus is going to come and evaluate your life, and you're either going to get to be put in the sheet pen, or you're going to be cast into the eternal fire. No. This story is giving us a vision for our life and what assumptions we make about our life and ourselves and how they drive our behavior. True righteousness is a recognition of our interdependence, an acknowledgement that we are part of a herd and that we are only healthy when each member of the herd has what they need to survive and that our well-being is dependent upon the kindness of others as well. That transformed vision then takes us out of this expectation that we better do this because Jesus demands it. And instead, this way of life causes kindness to flow out of us naturally from the core of our being. It becomes our orientation to the world. Kindness becomes our natural way of life. And that sharing of kindness, that is true righteousness. Amen.